Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Darren McBreen. Today is Wednesday, June 29th, 2016. Here's a quick look. What's coming up? Tonight, the Council on Foreign Relations argues the elite need to rise up against the mindless, angry, ignorant masses behind Brexit and the rise of Donald Trump. They still don't get it. We know what globalism is about. Then, Donald Trump says the next terror attack will be a Trojan horse. This could be the great Trojan horse of all time. Because you look at the migration, study it, look at it. Now they'll start infiltrating with women and children. It's not Trump dividing the nation, but the old divide and conquer tactic of the CIA coming home to America. And while many try to downplay illegal immigration, our cameras caught multiple groups crossing into the U.S. in a matter of hours. Jakari Jackson breaks down our broken border. All that and more on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. Yesterday, the so-called religion of peace struck again. At least 36 people were killed and almost 150 people injured in what Turkish officials are calling yet another radical Muslim terrorist attack by ISIS. It was a triple suicide bombing and gun attack at the international airport in Istanbul. The three gunmen were armed with AK-47s, and you can see the footage right there where a police officer shot one of the attackers who then fell to the ground and then detonated a bomb blowing himself up. The terrorist arrived at the airport in a taxi and they were able to launch the attack without going through security checks. Again, ISIS has claimed responsibility and they say they have sleeper cells that are active right here, right now, inside the continental United States. And guess what? Intelligence reports agree. The threat is real. ISIS is here. Meanwhile, the Obama administration has allowed and says it will continue to allow tens of thousands of Muslim refugees into the country. And those who are not shipped in, well, they find little resistance crossing our borders. Donald Trump says the migrant situation we are facing now is extremely dangerous. He calls it a Trojan horse. And he says ISIS will likely infiltrate America disguised as a Muslim refugee. This could be the great Trojan horse of all time. Because you look at the migration, study it, look at it. Now they'll start infiltrating with women and children. And we are joined now by a political activist and former member of the original Black Panther Party, the Larry Pinkney joins us now. And Larry, I can't wait to get your, your take on all this. I mean, don't you think it's common sense that ISIS would infiltrate or disguise themselves as a Muslim refugee, take advantage of the, the refugee crisis? Or do you think the rumors are true and Donald Trump just hates Muslims? Well, let, let's, let's use what you just referred to, and that's common sense. The reality is, is that ISIL, Daesh, etc., they've already indicated that this is precisely what they're going to do. What do I mean? That they're going to use the uh, refugee slash immigrant uh, uh, motif to enter into both Europe and the United States, etc. So, I mean, where are people's minds to ISIL or Daesh, whatever you choose to call it, themselves have made that clear. Also, if you look at the bombings that took place at the airport, and I'm not talking about yesterday, I'm talking about a few months ago in Brussels, Belgium, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, reports have already come out that uh, these folks who were involved, or at least some of them, uh, were working with other folks who said that they were, quote, refugees. Now, some of them were actually homegrown, whatever the hell that means, um, born and raised uh, in Belgium or France, all right? But we have to understand that it's not about racism. It's about common sense. And when people accuse other folks who are using common sense of racism, what does that tell you? 
it tells me that these folks have got their heads in the sand and their posterior sticking out. And guess what? Isil Daesh will kick their posteriors as they stick out of the sand. But unfortunately, those of us who have been warning about this, we are also in danger too. And I am certainly not anti uh, any religion as long as that religion adheres to just plain common human decency. That's all. Well, and, and here's the deal. It, you know, we now know that the Obama administration is largely responsible for arming these terrorists to begin with. I mean, they created that Frankenstein. And most yeah. of the public, they don't understand that ISIS was created by Western intelligence to start proxy wars in the Middle East. Right now, they're, they're in Libya, which Libya, let's face it, it's a, it's a failed state right now. They have strongholds and control large portions of Iraq. And they are being used by the Obama administration to take out President Bashir al-Assad in Syria. So we're sending these guys weapons. I mean, you've seen the, the mysterious weapons drops that uh, continue to somehow magically end up in the hands of, of Syrian militants in Syria and, and Iraq. Uh, we've seen the huge stockpile of weapons that are sent to them. They've got Toyota pickup trucks. They've got tanks. They've got Humvees. And uh, compliments in Benghazi, they now have surface to air missiles so mm -hmm. it, it is it is a total miss uh, out there right now and and none dare call it conspiracy I, instead they label it a conspiracy theory but i like to say i i call it this i say if president Ob obama is arming terrorists while at the same time disarming the american uh public i call that treason it is treason and he knows it's treason, but you see, he thinks he can get away with it. That's his objective, to get away with it. He doesn't care that it's treason, so what? And by the way, since you mentioned uh, what you just said uh, just a couple minutes ago, uh, just two or three weeks ago or thereabouts, Obama's Secretary of State, current Secretary of State, John Kerry, was confronted when he was visiting, I believe it was Italy, and told in no uncertain terms what? That the U.S. had created, and the, I'm not talking about the American people, I'm talking about the U.S. government, which are two different things. That the U.S. government had in fact created ISIL, diet, ISIS, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it, okay? This is not a conspiracy theory. I only wish it were. It is reality, and we better be prepared for it. Well, and, and by the way, I also want to point out that our ally in the Middle East, Turkey, and, and along with Saudi Arabia, you know, and, and Turkey was, was just attacked by ISIS yesterday, they played a major role in the creation of, of ISIS as well. And the Turkish prime minister himself was caught last November shipping guns to ISIS terrorists. So this, in my opinion, it's more than blowback, all right? This is the old familiar game that, that it, it was started by the CIA way back in the late 1940s. And you know, remember they, the, they took out Guatemala and then Iran, and then currently we're just talking about Syria, Libya, Iraq, and it's the game of divide and conquer. They destabilize right. the nation by wreaking havoc. They send in a bunch of bad guys to rape and pillage the nation. They send them arms. They create these massive protests, civil unrest, which usually ends up uh, at a, as a civil war. And then lo and behold, the United States walks in as the savior and establishes order out of chaos. And that's when they install their, their puppet dictators. They take control of the military. They rob the nation of its resources and they have another strategic placemat on the grand chessboard. And I'm here to tell you that they are doing the same thing in this country now. They're using the same techniques as divide and conquer, and there's nothing more that the Obama administration would rather see right now than a race war. Am I right? Well, not only that, of course you're right, but not only that, it's if you can divide people, keep those people in a state of constant fear of each other, fear of one another, then you can control and manipulate those people. And that's what the drone man, you know, NDAA signing, 
uh, double talking Barack Obama and his minions, including Hillary the Clinton. We we saw he died. What a bloodthirsty piece of something that is. But in any event, that's what it's all about. And it's not just uh, in the so-called Middle East or in Africa. But if you look back, uh, you'll see that they did the same thing in the former uh, national state of Yugoslavia, formerly called Yugoslavia. Same thing. Create these so-called revolutions. They're really not revolutions. Where but is, as you so eloquently pointed out, Darren, it's about causing havoc, uh, um, making sure that they can topple whatever uh, government is in power, especially if that government doesn't agree with uh, their policies, i.e. U.S. government policies, and then coming in as the so-called savior. In fact, they were the serpent, not the savior. They were the ones planting euphemistically the time bomb, and they're going off. So we in this country need to understand that they don't just do that in other countries. They're doing it right here, right here in the United States. Wake up. We must understand that. I'm sorry to get so animated, but people need to understand that's what this game is about. Hillary Clinton uh, Hillary the butcher, Hillary the liar, Hillary the murderer, Clinton, and 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 Barack Obama and his minions are all part of the same game of subterfuge and control and manipulation. So on that, that's where I'm coming. That's what I see. Same kind of thing. Only it's more sophisticated now, Darren. Well, that's right. I mean, uh, Martin Luther King had a dream, and now we've got a nightmare. Hey, I've got a quote for you uh, from jazz legend Miles Davis. When you hit a wrong note, it's the next note that makes it good or bad. And we've had eight years of Bush followed by eight years of Obama. I'd say that qualifies as hitting the wrong note. So the next note, uh, you know, it better not be... Hillary Clinton, or this country is done. Larry Pinkney, you got the last word. You got absolutely right. Go ahead, Miles Davis. I'm a big fan <laughs> of, of Miles, as you probably know. That's why I absolutely. picked it. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely correct. Absolutely. Let me just say to all of our listen, uh, viewers, listeners, brothers and sisters out there, please, please understand what the name of this game is. It's divide, control, and conquer. We must not let do that. Not in, in this country. In fact, not throughout Mother Earth. Thank you so much, Darren, my brother, and and my love and strength to all my brothers and sisters at Info War. All right, Larry. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you again real soon. And I just want to remind our audience that Larry Pinkney speaks from experience. I mean, the guy knows what he's talking about. We have the original. We have the FBI file that they have on Larry Pinkney. We got it through the Freedom of Information Act. This is the official file on Larry Pinkney, and it says Pinkney is potentially dangerous due to his demonstrated ability to unify black and white. His associates are Negro, white, and Chinese. Special attention is given to neutralizing him. And they did just that. Compliments of COINTELPRO. So this is a, a, this fight is real, ladies and gentlemen. They want to divide and conquer. And anybody who is out there unifying us is a direct threat to the globalists. Somebody somewhere will comment and say, Obama politicized this issue. Well, this is something we should politicize. I'm not going to carry a gun. I don't want to be involved in the gunfight. If I could have gotten 51 votes in the Senate of the United States for an outright ban, picking up every one of them, Mr. and Mrs. America, turn them all in. Go ahead, make my day. 
So the notion that gun laws don't work, it's not borne out by the evidence. He says that the Chicago police had a plan over this bloody 4th of July weekend. Nonetheless, as you indicated, Corey, there was a count of casualties that could have been from Afghanistan or Iraq. We'll make it harder for law-abiding citizens and criminals will still get their guns. In many cases, the offenders, uh, felons, uh, some out on parole, some out on bond. We have to respect the tradition in this country of people who want to defend themselves and their family from violence. There are people at high levels in this government who have bodyguards 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The average American does not have that. Mayor Bloomberg, why, why, why can you defend yourself but not... The majority of Americans, I mean, look at, look at the team of security you got. Every day, every school, at every level. One thing that I think is clear with young people and with adults as well is that we just have to be repetitive about this. And we need to do this every day of the week and just really brainwash people into thinking about guns in a vastly different way. Was this the weapon of choice for a new kind of terrorist? When a five-year-old girl said she and a classmate should shoot each other with bubbles, the school called it a terrorist threat. AK-47s belong in the hands of soldiers, not in the hands of criminals. You know, the right to bear arms is because that's the last form of defense against tyranny. Lay down your arms, you damn rebels! But we don't need the ability to arm ourselves against the army or the police. What kind of a situation in the U.S. would well, you see like that happening? See, I mean, we've got a lot of constitution with a lot of people that, that stockpile weapons. Discovered that clergy would help the government with potentially their biggest problem, us to say we're not turning our guns in and we're not running and we're not backing down if you want them come and take them i'm margaret hell for infowars.com talk about scurrying around after trump's speech the president president obama is in ontario today and he's meeting with the prime minister of canada justin trudeau and the mexican president president nieto and what are they talking about? They're talking about their, their bilateral relationship, their enhanced globalist union. Now, this is coming on the heels of a very historic speech, if you recall, that Donald Trump gave in Pennsylvania last night talking about economic trade policy and how it's terrible for the American worker. Now, we're going to get to a very specific clip of that speech now. Take a listen. Just as she's betrayed American workers for Wall Street and throughout, throughout her career, her whole career, she has betrayed the American worker. She's trying to put on a good front now. She will betray you again. Her career and her husband have signed so many disasters and never ever forget NAFTA. Just never ever forget it because you know what it's done and I know what it's done. And in touring, I've seen the devastation that it's left behind. Now reports initially in the media saying that this meeting was in response to Brexit. But ironically, Trump gave this impressive historic trade speech last night talking about the joblessness of the American worker and what he's going to do when he becomes president, firstly gutting NAFTA. We heard him say that in the seven-point plan. Now, what this means is a candidate is setting the policy, setting the politics for a sitting president of the United States, despite media reports saying that this is in response to Brexit it doesn't take a genius to realize that Trump's trade policy has lit a fire under the president. He's going to solidify his NAFTA bros while he still can. Well, the president's trade meeting, it included a plea, a plea to all of the people of North America. This is what the leaders were asking. They, the leaders of the U.S., Mexico, and Canada, they say, be bold, look beyond the immediate problems of the present. Yeah, like the massive loss of jobs that people are experiencing in this country because of NAFTA. They want you to see far beyond that. Then they went on to stress how important global warming was and what they're going to do to tackle that. Now, media reports, they say that this was in response to Brexit, but Trump gave that historic speech less than 12 hours ago, and we saw our president scramble to make sure that his NAFTA bros, the globalists, stay in power, that the narrative stays the same, and oh yeah, it's all because of Brexit. It has nothing to do with Trump. Now, speaking of globalists that are very upset with Trump igniting those angry nationalists. I want to take you to one in particular, James Traub. And he, is, he wrote this for Foreign Policy magazine. He, he originally writes for the New York Times. On occasion, he is an heir to the Bloomingdale chain. And this is what he had to say regarding Trump and the angry nationalists that he's incited. 
Traub urges the forces to keep out the nationalists. He's writing this from an elitist perspective. He says, did I say ignorant regarding those angry nationalists? Yes, I did. It's necessary to say people are deluded. And the task of leadership, i.e. the leaders, is to undelude them. Is that elitist? Maybe it is. Maybe we become so inclined to celebrate the authenticity of all personal conviction. And then he goes, on and on and on, laying out the case for why it's good to be an elitist, A, that the leaders, the globalist movement, they've got to get control of this angry mob. Don't celebrate the individualism of, of people and their, and their voice and their free expression. God forbid. We need to get a handle on this before it takes over and, and dissolves all of our globalist policies. That's what he's saying. He sounds very afraid to me. And it's echoing the same fear that the president expressed when he hopped on a plane this morning, scurried up to Canada to make sure that our trade deal with Canada and Mexico is still very much in place, towing that line. Well, as if we needed a lecture from James Traub over the lessons of history, over how Brexit was an utter repudiation of bankers and, and economists, an example of extremism gone mainstream. You know, some of us think that globalism is the extremism, and finally people are waking up they understand what's happening. And Trump has, has made a very interesting case that NAFTA has not been good for the American worker. He highlighted the loss of manufacturing jobs. He laid out a very specific plan about what he's going to do with the trade policies that haven't benefited the American worker. Meanwhile, the president is trying to strengthen his, his ties our ties at the moment with, with globalist policies of NAFTA and our counterparts. We're going to have to wait and see how this plays out. But it looks like, if I'm not mistaken, Trump has actually set the stage, set the policy agenda for a sitting president. Now moving on to the Second Amendment and certain lawmakers that are taking a direct assault on your right to concealed carry. I'm speaking specifically of Senator Charlie Rangel out of New York. Senator Rangel, who has armed security himself, says, said that's perfectly fine. It's just not a right if you do. Now we have a small clip of Rangel and his attitude about this, his rationale. Take a look. Well, I should say the uh, uber wealthy who, who have protection, had that protection, but individuals who are law-abiding citizens in your district should not. Let's talk about that. Well, law-abiding citizens just shouldn't have to carry a gun. You know that. So you're not going to push me in that direction. But you're protected by guns all over the place here in the Capitol. <laughs> Well, that's a little different. I think we deserve, I think we need to be protected down here. Now, we basically heard him give the argument for why it's okay for him to keep himself safe, just not you. Um, he's very troubled with people in his district having guns. He says, we don't need that many guns. I don't know that briberies were involved in getting guns. He's talking about a specific case here, and, and I'll reference that in a second. And that is wrong, but overall, it's, diff it's difficult to get a concealed weapon permit, and I'm glad to hear it. Now, we're speaking of the same Senator Rangel that was under an ethics committee investigation. He was found guilty of 11 violations surrounding personal finance and campaign finance. Uh, we're talking about a veteran senator here who, by all accounts, um, unethical. Let me translate that. If he were a citizen, a regular citizen, not a senator, committing the same acts of, of fraud, if you will, he'd be in jail. So he'd actually be a criminal. But because he's a senator, he was only dragged before the ethics committee, censored, nothing really happened to him. But it's okay if he is, is guarded with armed guards, just not you. You don't have a right to protect yourself. How do you like that? One corrupt senator saying that people don't have a basic right to the Second Amendment. Now, he echoes a sentiment that many lawmakers across the board, federally, state lawmakers, they feel, I want to get to that in a second, but talking about states for a second, states like Maryland, California, the District of Columbia, in fact, their firearms permitting approval requirements, they're very stringent. You have to give good cause to have a firearm in places like that, despite 37,000 issued licenses, including um, people like Mr. Rangel, for example, those who guard him, prominent business, prominent business leaders, elected officials, judges and attorneys, they're fine. But the rest of us, we need to show a very good reason why we need that kind of protection. Now, Rangel isn't the only member on the Hill to be very anti-gun. Senator Feinstein has made some pretty remarkable statements regarding the Second Amendment herself. I brought a clip just for you. Take a look. If I could have gotten 51 votes in the Senate of the United States for an outright ban, picking up every one of them, Mr. and Mrs. America, turn them all in. I would have done it. I could not do that. 
the votes weren't here. So it's okay for lawmakers to be guarded, but little law-abiding peons like you and I, we have no right to the Second Amendment. Now, this troubling sentiment, it's echoed on the state level as well. We saw Hawaii a pass a bill, it went through their house successfully. It went on their governor's desk to sign. This bill was sponsored by Senator Will Asparrow about gun control and what he wants to do. Every law-abiding citizen in the state of Hawaii that has a firearm, he wants to put them in an FBI criminal database, which Hawaii is doing pretty successfully. That means even if you've never committed a crime, never had an issue before, you just have a firearm, you're now on the FBI, you're on an FBI list, they're watching you in a criminal database. Now Hawaii would be the first state where residents who own firearms would be in a federal criminal records database. Now we've heard a lot this past week about no fly, no buy, and this arbitrary fly, no fly list that is executed at random, if you will. We're not really certain how somebody gets on it, but what we are sure about is if once you're on it, it is nearly impossible to get off of it. And that type of power, that type of secrecy, they're wanting to tie somebody who's on that do not fly list to a no buy list. So not only are they arbitrarily on a no fly list, but they also can't buy a gun for whatever reason. With all this information, it looks like the Second Amendment is under assault, but it's good to know at least our lawmakers they practice what they preach, right? I'm Margaret Howe reporting for Infowars.com. Recently, we went back down to the U.S.-Mexico border to visit McAllen, Texas. Now, if you guys recall, it was two years ago that we went down there and we spoke to the emergency manager who gave us some very surprising news. Now, I'm just curious as to what point these people come in contact with the Border Patrol. Do you know... Originally? Yes. You'd have to ask them. It's the only ones that you'll see here are family units mm -hmm. that are like a mom and a couple of kids that they have determined don't pose any sort of security risk and right. don't have a criminal background and they've got relatives or um, help somewhere in the interior. Mm -hmm. So that category of people, again, it was our understanding they provide them a ticket right? and then they drop the them Border Patrol provides them a ticket? That's what we were told and that's what I understood, but obviously some of them didn't. Or, or they're arranging tickets with them there, There's you know what I mean, means. with a relative that's paying for something, I don't know. And that was two years ago. Now, since then, more news outlets have gotten around to reporting it, and I say better late than never. But this time around, we spoke to a Border Patrol vice president who also gave us some very uh, intriguing intel. He was telling us about the numbers of people that, they were, that were coming over the border, uh, how frequently they pick them up, pretty much on a routine basis. He said you can go out there two or three times a day, and they just do a sweep, and they pick up large groups of people. And here's what he had to say. On a general, let's say a month, uh, what type of drugs do you encounter and what quantities? Uh, the, the most common is marijuana. We see thousands upon thousands of pounds weekly. Um, we do see a lot of cocaine. We see, we're starting to see heroin and meth a lot more. Usually those were reserved for the ports of entry, but now they started running those across the river as well. Okay. And as far as the people coming over, are your agents encountering any type of uh, infectious diseases, people with illnesses as they cross the border? Oh, most definitely. We see tuberculosis pretty regularly, um, scabies. Um, more often than not, we have large amounts of uh, infectious diseases as far as scabies go. And the interesting part with that is it's, it's not actually um, seen on the body during the infectious period. And so these people clear through our system and then they go into the, the rest of the country with that disease. Uh, we see a lot of uh, measles, a lot of chicken pox, um, a lot of unidentified illnesses that, that you know, a lot of uh, lung infections that we have no idea what they are. And again, that's just what we catch. Right. Okay, now we've seen reports of the quarantine facilities uh, at your Border Patrol stations. Some reports saying that they're just a piece of yellow tape. But since then, has the situation improved at all? No, not at all. You know, we do still have the yellow tape. Uh, sometimes they use a red tape. I don't know if there's any significance there. Um, we do have uh, nurses and doctors that are on staff that are there, but as far as a quarantine facility or an actual um, method of, of treating these people and, and, uh, and, and really quarantining them so it doesn't spread, we don't have that. So with this knowledge in hand, we decided to go down to the border ourselves, and we were probably out there maybe an hour or so before a raft started to float across from the Mexico side and come here to the U.S. side. And we were driving around, we encountered multiple Border Patrol agents, also people there from the Wildlife Preserve who were very interested in our activities, saying, what are you guys doing out here? We said, well, we're just reporters from Austin, Texas, and we want to report on what's happening out here. 
And it was a very interesting situation because uh, even though they had no clear signs posted, they kept telling us that we were on private land. I'm like, well, where does it begin and end? When you drive in, uh, I guess, to the private land, as they keep saying it was, there was no overt sign saying that you're entering federal property or a uh, wildlife reserve or anything to that notion. But regardless, I, I digress. So we're driving around and we're wondering where this group of people went. You know, where do they go? Uh, were they contacted by Border Patrol? And while we were driving around, we actually saw people in the back of a Border Patrol truck. I guess they had recently been picked up. And while we were doing our rounds, we actually ran into a family. And here's what happened when our reporter, Don Salazar, had a chance to speak to them. Uh, Are you from Mexico? Mexico? Uh, El Salvador. Salvador. El Salvador. Yeah, El Salvador. Okay. Everyone? Todos. Yes. We came together. Okay. How long was your journey to get here? It took us two months. We were working and working on the way up until we got here. Where we're at. We just want to complete the journey. But we're already tired and thirsty and hungry. Eventually we'll get where we want to go. But it's getting impossible. And that was just on day one. We decided to go back a second day and like the first day we ran into a lot of officers out there very inquisitive about our activities. And while they're questioning us, a raft comes across from the Mexico side to the US side. And if you look real close to this footage, you can actually see a guy jump out of the boat and swim back to the Mexico side. I'm not exactly sure what his motivation was in doing that, but it definitely did happen. And it's not just people coming over the border. They have drugs, of course, the issue of human trafficking, all these other things that the Border Patrol have to deal with. And long story short, if you take the interviews we did with the emergency manager or the Border Patrol agents or the ICE agents when we, when we went out there two years ago, the main consensus between all those people is at some point, the focal point goes back to the McAllen bus station. Uh, now, this is where it gets a little, a little dicey. Not everybody agrees on how the people are provided with their travel vouchers, but they pretty much agree that they get some type of funding or a ticket courtesy of somebody else to travel around the United States of America because the people we met came from El Salvador and whatever provisions they left with ran out a very long time ago. So they had no food, no water, I'm sure if they had any money, they had spent it by that point just to get there. They had been traveling for two months, a very long journey. Um, the group we saw was about 20 people, men, well, one man, if I recall correctly, and also mostly women and children. So the only thing they had at their point at the point was the clothes on their back. So somebody is providing these people with travel vouchers. So they go to the McAllen bus station. There's also a church nearby. They help them out with food, clothing, uh, maybe put a little money in their pocket, possibly. And then they go about in the country. And the big issue with this is that when these people are sent around around the country, very few of them come back for the actual court hearing, for the immigration hearing. And why would you? You travel two months, you're not going to go all the way back to McAllen, Texas, just so you can be uh, you know, sent back to wherever you came from. And one of the things to note about this is the people we talked to, the Border Patrol agents or whoever else, they told us that when people come from Mexico, they usually just send them back across the border, uh, pretty much a catch and release type of program. But when they come from further away, such as El Salvador, Guatemala, someplace like that, they're allowed to stay temporarily, you know, uh, pending their court hearing, as I already stated, very few people show up to. So this is the thing that's going on at the border. And while we do know this is going on, it's always somewhat in our mind. And just think about this as sad as these stories are to see these people who come all the way from Guatemala or wherever else they may be coming from. What are the situations in their country that are forcing them to leave? Because it's not just people coming from Latin America, people are coming from Syria, people are coming from China, as the Border Patrolman told us in our interview. And also, we know the people who are coming from Central, South America, are you getting people from other countries yes. as well? Most, yeah, most definitely. We're getting, um, you name it, we're getting them. Chinese, India, uh, the Middle East, um, all over. We, if they're out there, they're coming through this southern border. And when you think about people coming from these foreign countries, if I lived in Pakistan or I lived in Syria, or some other place, uh, Yemen, where they have these routine drone strikes, you know, blowing up hospitals and churches, blowing up wedding parties. I'd probably want to move out of there too. So let's just say for the sake of argument, we do put out blanket amnesty, make everybody currently here 
a United States citizen. What are we going to do tomorrow to stop people from coming here? And a lot of people would be happy to stay in their own country if they had a steady economy or they didn't have to worry about war or famine or, or these other things that are going on around the world. I think that's a much larger issue that needs to be addressed, just like the issue of immigration. You can find more reports on Infowars.com. The CFR says now is the time for the elite to rise up against the mindless and ignorant masses. And this is their final push for a total UN takeover of America. Here's John Bowne. Something wicked this way comes. The elites have been backed into a corner by the Brexit and the potential downfall of the EU. Populism is sweeping the globe. While a still unseen event between the globalist arrogant and criminal one-sided policies against the law-abiding freedom of the average American is reaching a breaking point. In an opinion piece posted today on the Wall Street Journal, former Secretary of State war criminal and New World Order cheerleader Henry Kissinger put it bluntly to any of the elites listening. Kissinger wrote, the multilateral approach based on open borders for trade and the movement of peoples is increasingly being challenged. And now an act of direct democracy intended to reaffirm the status quo has rendered a damning verdict. However, challenging this expression of popular sentiment, ignoring the concerns it manifests, is a path to greater disillusionment. The Brexit vote has unleashed the anxieties of two continents and of all those who rely upon the stability that their union of purpose provides. To inspire the confidence of the world, Europe and America must demonstrate confidence in themselves. As far as confidence in Congress and the executive branch goes, the average American has been fed up for years, and the elites Mr. Kissinger would pander to are completely clueless. Paul Joseph Watson writes, Council on Foreign Relations member James Traub argues that the elite need to rise up against the mindlessly angry, ignorant masses in order to prevent globalization from being derailed by the populist revolt that led to Brexit and the rise of Donald Trump. Traub's tone is so contemptuous, he even describes the pro-Trump Republican base as know-nothing voters and sneers at voters in Poland for being concerned about values and tradition while stressing that the push for further globalization will pit poor and non-white and marginal citizens against working class and middle class whites, whom he describes as angry fist shakers. Well then, how do Traub and his tiny number of delusional ilk intend on rising up against the so-called ignorant masses? Killer robots? The UK's Sun newspaper claims terrorists are actively seeking to build a deadly army of intelligent killer robots. Yeah, right. Terrorists building the Terminator. But the Sun continues. That's the terrifying claim from a piece of authoritative research published by the United Nations, which recently held an urgent meeting to discuss the threat posed by murderous machines. Experts from dozens of countries convened in Geneva to consider the grim implications of lethal autonomous weapon systems, laws, which are capable of killing without needing to have a human at the controls. And therein lies the elite's go-to plan, the United Nations Army, be they terrorist robots, child-raping soldiers, radical Islamists, or simply your local city council member. By hook or by crook, the United Nations socialist tsunami known as Agenda 2030 with a 15-year master plan to transform the world is underway. U.S. Attorney General Loretta Lynch announced the Strong Cities Network at the U.N. in New York in September of 2015. Basically, a cancerous globalization of your neighborhood police force with its sights set on violent extremists, i.e. constitutionalists, a.k.a. Americans. A handful of cities have begun the transformation as Alex Newman of The New American writes, wherein control of local law enforcement is handed over to a London-based think tank called the Institute for Strategic Dialogue. It's not just any old alliance that is behind the ISD. A quick search of the group's website reveals the identity of its board of trustees, a cadre of internationalists that is second to none. 
Among the 14 board members is found Charles Guthrie, Baron Guthrie of Craigie Bank, a member of the House of Lords who currently acts as a non-executive director of global financier N.M. Rothschild and & Sons and represents the firm's interest on the Trilateral Commission. Guthrie also spoke at the 2011 meeting of the Bilderberg Group. Meanwhile, the UN is stockpiling billions of dollars worth of food and vaccines in the United States for what exactly? Michael Snyder of the Economic Collapse blog writes, An NPR report indicates that most of the supplies are medical in nature, and this includes millions of doses of vaccines. Could it be possible that the government is anticipating a major pandemic in our near future? And according to Reuters, global demand for food has already been surging. And one new report indicates that it won't be too long before we could see a doubling of food prices. And with all of this comes a recent posting of UN vehicles being transported through Virginia. Yes, debunking troll, we are all aware that the 16,600 pound vehicles designed to withstand gas attacks and small arms fire are manufactured manufactured in the United States, and this could possibly be much ado about nothing, but sightings of the transportation of UN vehicles all across the United States have been an ongoing occurrence. With the expanding erosion of the Bill of Rights, independence from tyranny is reaching pre-American revolution levels. The globalists, a self-serving handful of sociopathic billionaires that have long since taken possession of the neural centers of the globe's economic brain i.e. the central banks, will stop at nothing to dominate the mechanisms they have put into place to ensure that the masses are enslaved. And what about those angry fist-shaking masses? Undoubtedly, this forthcoming July 4th celebration will ring true with an ominous tone within the hearts and minds of the descendants of the founders that warned us this day was coming. John Bound for Infowars.com Hey, that's going to do it for tonight's broadcast. The InfoWars Nightly News will return tomorrow evening, 7 o'clock p.m. Central Time. Don't forget to check out the Alex Jones Show, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., actually till 3 p.m. because we have that hour overdrive. And that is Monday through Friday. Y'all have a good night. We'll see you back here tomorrow. See you.